If you'll find your place in your Bible this morning, Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. And I want to read to you the first six verses of Ecclesiastes 11. This is the next to the last message. Next week I will bring the final message in this series from Ecclesiastes. Thank you to everyone who's offered words of encouragement over uh, these past few weeks. As I've been preaching through this book, there's a lot more here to be gleaned. I don't mean to suggest that I've exhausted everything that's here, but I've touched on the high points on the mountaintops through this book And I hope that it has been helpful and it's been a blessing to you. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a serving to seven and also to eight, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or the north, In the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know what is the way of the wind, or how the bones grow in the womb of her who was with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. In the morning sow your seed, and in the evening do not withhold your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, either this or that or whether both alike will be good. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do ask in these next few minutes that you'll allow us to see the truth that is here. It'll transform so many people's lives if they'll simply hear it and apply it. Lord, we have a tendency when we talk about the subject I'm talking about today to put up walls and to keep from hearing and keep from applying. But today, Lord, I pray that you'll allow us to to at least hear what's being said, to consider what's being said, and then to recognize that there are blessings that await those who obey what you say. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. There's a contemporary author today that maybe you're familiar with. His name is Randy Alcorn. He's written a number of different books. There are three or four that I especially like. He has a book on heaven, a very thick book on heaven, where he goes through the entirety of Scripture and he gleans all of the truth out of Scripture about heaven. He even in the back of it has a section where you have questions about heaven that people ask. We don't have Bible to back some of the things up that he says, but he gives answers, potential answers to some of those questions. Uh, He has another book that I really like that I read. It also was a very thick uh, volume. It's called... uh, Uh, is God good? In in the world where we have so much evil and so much terrible things, so many terrible things that are going on around us, is God good? It's an incredible book about how do you reconcile a good God with the evil of the world. But two or three of the other books that he's written are about the the subject of finances and about the subject uh, of money. One of them that every Christian really should read is called The Treasure Principle. How many of you have read that book, The Treasure Principle? Every person ought to read that book about uh, being a a giver, making sure that you're giving back to God, The Treasure Principle. But in some of the books that he's written about the subject of stewardship and about the use of our money for the advancing of the gospel, he says this, throughout the entire Bible, there are roughly 2,350 verses concerning money. This is roughly twice as many as faith and prayer combined. 15%, hear that number, 15% of everything Jesus said related to money and possessions. He spoke about money and possessions more than heaven and hell combined. The only subject he says Jesus spoke of more often is the kingdom of God. And then he asks the question, why? And he answers, Because the scriptures make clear there is a fundamental connection between a person's spiritual life and his attitudes and actions concerning money and possessions. Often, he says, we divorce the two. Christ sees them as essentially related to one another. When you think about our money and our possessions, we as Americans have the tendency to think that we own it and we control it. We made it so we can determine how we use it. 
But the reality is, as it's presented to us in Scripture, is that God is the giver of all things, and everything we have comes from him, and that you and I are merely stewards of those resources. We are managers of the resources that God has given to us, and that one day we will have to give an account to God for how we stewarded, how we managed those resources, and whether or not we prioritized the things that God prioritized. But our tendency is to want to separate these two things out. It's amazing how much of the Bible is about money. It's, a, it's about our stewardship of the resources and managing of the resources that God has given to us. As a matter of fact, you're in a passage right now this morning with me in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 1 to 6, that's dealing with our resources. It's dealing with our money. It's dealing with the use of our resources and the use of our money. And who could teach us better about how to have the good life and how to experience the good life other than Solomon? I mean, he's tried all of these things of the world, all of the ways of the world, and he's ended up on a dead-end street every time, and he's found himself unfulfilled. He doesn't have purpose and meaning in life because he's turned his heart away from the Lord. And he comes at the end of this book and he says, let me tell you how to have a real life. The real life is found not in getting. The real life is found in giving. The good life is not found in getting. The good life is found in giving. Giving generously. What I want to do in the next few moments is I want to deal with some details that, that maybe are beyond the normal sermon, but I want to make sure that you see them for just a few moments. There's two common interpretations of these six verses in Ecclesiastes chapter 11. More modern commentators today say that these six verses are dealing with commerce. They're dealing with business. You cast your bread on the water, meaning that you put your goods onto the ship's all of those ships that, that Solomon had, you put your goods onto the ships and you put them out in other places. You don't just keep them in one ship or on one ship or in one place. In verse 2, he says, you serve to seven and also to eight. You diversify your investments and make sure that you don't put everything on one ship. All of your eggs in one basket is the way we would say it today. That you put your goods out and in time, you'll have a... Uh, you'll have a return. You'll have a harvest that comes back to you. It'll come back to you in time. You don't know when that time will be, but if you've diversified and you've put your goods out to, to be purchased by others, then ultimately you're going to have a return. It could have been grain. It could have been things that were made. And, and they look at this passage of Scripture and they see in it uh, a commerce. They see in it a business arrangement. As a matter of fact, if you read much from the New Living Translation, you will note at this particular passage that they have done more than just translate. They have interpreted the translation. I want you to look at it. It'll be on the screens, and you can follow along with me. Just the first two verses of Ecclesiastes 11, 1 through 6. Verse 1, this is how they translate it. Send your grain across the seas. And in time, profits will flow back to you. But divide your investments among many places, for you do not know what risks might lie ahead. Now, you'll agree with me, that's good, sound business advice, right? That's good, sound investment advice. Any businessman or any businesswoman in this room knows that you want to diversify and you got to put your goods out where people can purchase them and make them available. If you're going to have a return, they've got to be available. And... The New Living Translation doesn't just translate the words of this passage, this Hebrew passage. They add an interpretation to it. Now, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily. In your New Living Translation, if you have a study Bible, you'll notice that it has a note. And over in the column or maybe down at the bottom of the page, it specifically gives you the other understanding of this passage. And they tell you, in essence, we have added our interpretation to what this passage actually means, that we think it means commerce, that we think it means a business venture of some kind. And maybe it does. But that's not been the understanding of this passage for the longest period of time. 
The other detail that you need to know is that for the longest period of time, when he says, cast your bread on the waters, it was interpreted and it was understood to be applying to generosity. It was interpreted to be applying to liberality, to taking your resources and sowing them on the water. In other words, you, you wouldn't normally do that. That's not something that most people would think of doing because you don't know what's going to happen to it or if it's going to come back to you. But he's telling you, let go of it. Sow, those, sow, those, uh, sow that bread on the water. These are flat cakes. This is not bread like you get down at the grocery store. You know, this wrapped in plastic with a twisty tie on it. These are flat pieces of bread that would float on top of the water, and you don't know where it's going. And he's saying, in essence, the other interpretation is be generous, be liberal. It's not your responsibility to worry about where it goes and where it ends up. It's your responsibility to be liberal and generous in your giving. And that has been the general understanding of this passage until the past century or so. Trevor Longman, in his commentary, writes, a popular interpretation understands the verse to refer to charity, a view that has been espoused from antiquity to modern times. Another author writes, for more than 18 centuries, there was never any doubt about what was meant here. Franz Deletsch, who is a German scholar, most pastors have his Old Testament. He and his friends, Old Testament commentary, six volumes uh, from the Hebrew text in our libraries, Fran Delech noted that in the 19th century, most interpreters regarded this as an exhortation to charity. Or another interpreter, John Lang, in his commentary writes, he is not saying cast it away nor send it away in ships as merchandise, but rather give it away in uncertainty without hope of profit or immediate return. One other writer that's a contemporary of our day. His name is Ray Stedman. He went to heaven in 1992, but he pastored for 40 years the Peninsula Bible Church out in California, and he was a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary, and he's written numerous books, a great expositor of the Word of God. This is what he says about the passage. The idea expressed here is one of open-handed generosity, Give freely, wisely, and generously. Cast your bread upon the waters was a proverb in Israel for what looked like wasteful expenditure. No one would take good bread and throw it in the river. But here we are enjoined to do that very thing. This is not encouraging us to thoughtlessly and carelessly give away our money, spending it like a drunken sailor. What is meant is be willing to take a chance where a real need is evident. And so even Ray Stedman says this about giving. Now you say, do I really need to know those two details? Did you really have to bring them to my attention? And the answer is absolutely yes, because the approach I'm taking today, I want you to understand is not something that's new, and it's not just in my own mind. It's something that comes out of history, the interpretation of Scripture. Actually, you can go all the way back to the Targum, the gathering of the interpretations of the Jewish scholars of the ancient world, and they interpreted the Scripture in very much the same way, that what he was teaching here was the matter of generosity, that what he was teaching here was the matter of liberality. He wasn't teaching about business ventures or about commerce, Though it may be applied in that sense, he was teaching here that we don't think about the bread that's in our hand and being wasteful. We give. We give generously and we give liberally without thought about those other matters. And we know that in time, God will bring it back, the reward that God will bring it back to us. So that what he's talking about in these six verses is you and me being generous. I stated it earlier. The good life is not about getting. Get all you can get, can all you can can, and sit on the can. It's not about getting. The good life is about giving. Giving all you can, being as generous and liberal in your giving as you can possibly be. That's been the traditional interpretation of this passage all the way back to the Jewish scholars whose writings are collected in the Targum. Now, 
as you think about that approach to this passage, not a business passage, not a commerce passage, but a passage about being generous and liberal in our giving, there's, there's three statements that I want to make to you, and I, I hope you'll write them down and you'll remember them, that come right out of these six verses that are before you. First, what he's telling us is, number one, give generously and then give some more. <laughs> give generously and then give some more. There's two verbs here in uh, verses one and two that, the, that are the only commands in these six verses. The first verb is the word cast. It's an imperative. He's telling you, do this. The second verb is in verse two at the beginning. It's the word give. It's an imperative. He's telling you to do this. Those are the two verbs, both of which are imperatives. But think about that first verse for a moment. The word cast, that indicates a decision for action to be taken. At some point, you've got to make up your mind that I'm going to be generous and I'm going to be liberal, liberal in my giving so that I make the decision to cast the bread on the water. Now, you can imagine if you've got hungry mouths to feed or you've worked hard in the preparation of that bed, bread to make it for your family to be able to eat, to take some of it and to cast it on the water couldn't have been an easy decision to make, but you've got to make that decision. When he says your bread he means something of value to you that must be ventured. Something that's of value to you that must be ventured. Uh, in our case, as we're talking today, we're talking primarily about our resources, our time, our talents, and our treasures. Something that's valuable to us that has to be put out there and ventured for the, for the Lord in giving in generosity. Then he says, after many days. That means we have to be patient. There's patience in waiting for results. When we give, sometimes in the business world, you give and, or you put your goods out and you get immediate response. But when it comes to giving, you have to wait. You might not see the results or the return until you stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. But the fact of the matter is, there has to be that patience in waiting for the results. But then he says, and you shall find it. That's a promise, a promise of rewards that come from taking a step of faith. So that what Solomon is saying here is that life is not about giving. Life is about giving. And it may seem silly for some to have bread thrown out onto the water. But for those of us who understand that God gives back to give generously and to give liberally is to invoke the promise of God and to wait for the reward that God has promised he would return to us. It's very much the principle of Luke chapter 6. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give into your bosom? They'll give back to you. Do you see what he's saying? Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a serving to seven and also to eight. When you see those numbers like that, that's a figure of speech. It's an undetermined a number. He's not saying you give it to seven, you give it to eight, once you've done that, you're through. It, it's, an, it's an undetermined number. It's, it's an infinite number. You just give and you give generously and then you give some more and you just keep looking for ways to give. Dr. Walter Kaiser, who is an Old Testament Hebrew scholar as well, an Old, Old Testament scholar, he says this passage means to be liberal and generous to as many as you can. Now listen to the words. Be as generous as, to as many as you can and then some. I like that. And then some. And then some. It was Winston Churchill who said that we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. And what he's enjoining upon us here is that we would be generous givers, that we would be liberal givers that we would stop holding on to and stop trying to control everything about our resources, but we'd learn to give them away in a way that advances the gospel and advances the cause of, uh, of God. The kind of generosity that's pictured here is the kind that you see in John chapter 11 where Mary comes into the room. She has a very expensive uh, bottle of ointment and she begins pouring that ointment onto the feet of Jesus in this expressive love that she's giving to Jesus. And Judas, in that room that day, looks at her and says, this waste, she's making a waste 
of what she has. Look, it could have been sold. It could have been sold and all these people could have been fed if we'd have just had that oil. She's pouring it out on Jesus. But that's the very picture that generous, liberal gift that Mary was giving to Jesus that day. This generosity is pictured in the widow of Zarephath who freely gave her last meal to the prophet of God. You remember Elijah? God directs Elijah uh, to this widow of Zarephath, and he says, I need something to drink. But then as she goes to get him something to drink, she said, he says, I need something to eat as well. And she turns and says, all I have is just a little bit left, and it was going to be our last meal, and then me and my son, we were going to die. And the prophet says, bring me something to eat. But then you know what happens? She brings it to the prophet, and the next time she goes to look in the cupboards, it's been replenished. It's been replaced. And she pictures the kind of generosity. She took the very last meal she had, and she gave it to the prophet. This generosity is pictured in the churches of Macedonia. I'm going to be talking about these churches in a couple of weeks from now. These churches that were burdened and concerned for the Christians in Jerusalem who were hurting, they were being persecuted. It was severe. They were doing without the needs of life. And what it says about these churches in Macedonia is that they were themselves in extreme poverty, and yet they took an offering And in the generosity and the liberality of their heart, they gave to those believers in Jerusalem. Though they had so little themselves, they gave in generosity and liberality out of what they had to those that were in Jerusalem. That's the picture. This is the the, the, the generosity that's being pictured here is the generosity of Jesus. The generosity of Jesus as he pours out his life even to death for you and for me. So that when Solomon says these words, cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days. Give a serving to seven and also to eight, a figure of speech meaning meaning an undetermined amount, an undetermined number. For you do not know what evil will be on the earth. He's saying you gotta be generous. You gotta be liberal in your giving. It may look foolish, And a lot of people look at our giving to the local church. They look at our giving to the work of God in other ways. And they say, you're giving 10% of your income back to your local church. You're giving beyond that to the ministries of missions and to other things that the church is involved in and other things where God is at work around the world. You're doing that with that money? And they think you're crazy, like somebody taking bread and casting it on the water doesn't make sense to them. But what was being enjoined by Solomon here is that you don't make a life by what you get. You make a life by what you give. You want the good life, be a giver, not a taker. He's trying to encourage generosity because he knows as he comes to the finish line of this journal, the finish line of this book, he knows that the real life can't be found in amassing things for yourself that the real life, the good life is found in being a channel of those things out to others. And in learning to give to others, you find that it returns to you. And you don't just give to you reach one particular point. You give as much as you can possibly give. As I worded it, you give generously and then give some more. A name you might not know so well, but I hope you will after today, is the name R.G. Letourneau. Is that a name familiar to you? Nearly 70% of the earth-moving equipment and engineering vehicles that were used by the Allied forces during World War II were built from his designs and machinery. Letourneau invented and manufactured machines that laid most of the original highway infrastructure in the United States, and we desperately need to expand it, right? Right? If you've been on the interstates lately, we definitely need to expand it. At one time in his life, at the end of his life, he held 300 patents himself. What you might not know about Letourneau is that his sister was a missionary. And his sister didn't want her brother to go into business 
for himself. She wanted him to be an evangelist or a pastor or a missionary, and he wrestled with it for a long time as a young man. Should I do that? And one day he went to his pastor, and they had a long conversation, and they prayed at the end of that meeting, and his pastor told him, God needs businessmen as well as preachers and missionaries. And so Letourneau went into business and became I guess arguably the best businessman of that particular time, the best, uh, the best mechanic or mechanical engineer of that time. But here's what's so interesting about him. Early on in his career, he made God his senior business partner. Did you hear that? In his business, he made God his senior business partner. That ended up leading Mr. Letourneau to living on 10% of the profits that he made and giving away 90% of his income from his business and individually back to the work of God. He lived on 10% and he gave 90% of it away. That's what Solomon's talking about. Cast your bread on the water. Cast your bread on the water to seven or to eight, an undisclosed number. It's an undetermined number. It's a figure of speech. You just keep giving, and you keep giving more, and you look for more ways to bless the work of God and bless the expansion of the gospel around the world. And you give, and you give, and you give, and people stop and say, why are you throwing your bread on the water? Solomon says that in time, if you'll just be patient, in many days it'll come back to you. And he makes that promise. Can I just focus my attention for a few moments on the work of God? The work of God requires resources for it to be accomplished. We had two children. We have two children. They're not children anymore. They're grown adults into their 40s with families of their own. But do you know those children cost us a boatload? (laughs) They cost us a boatload. I mean, they wanted to eat. Uh, They wanted to have heating and cooling in the house. They wanted clothes to wear. They wanted to look like the other kids that they went to school with. I mean, there were, you know, fees that you had to pay for the schooling. There was the schooling bill because we put them through Christian school. Uh, There was... Uh, All of the things that you had to do as far as uh, the extra fees, if you wanted to play baseball or you wanted to play soccer or you wanted to play play basketball, there had to be special shoes and special uniforms and all the things that you had to have. And they cost us money. I'm telling you, if we had all the money back that we spent on them, Mary and I would be sitting pretty right now. Well, she's sitting pretty anyway. But we'd be sitting pretty right now. But you know what? If you got kids that are alive, that are growing, that have breath in their lungs, that have life, it's going to cost you something, isn't it? Something that's alive inevitably costs you something. I read the story, sad story, of a, of a man who was telling about the child that he and his wife lost at childbirth. They were expecting to hold a beautiful baby in their arms, breathing, crying aloud like all babies do after they're born, but instead they held in their arms a stillborn child. And he and his wife said that they would have done anything, they would have done anything to have had that child, no matter how much it cost them. They would have done anything. If something's alive, it costs money. I'll never forget the time I got on the elevator. I think I've told this before. At St. Mary's Hospital, not recently, many years ago. And a doctor got on with me, and I was wearing my hospital badge. And I didn't know him, and he didn't know me. And I guess he was trying to make conversation, and he said something to the effect, Oh, you're one of those who's always asking for money. Now, to be honest with you, I look back on it all these years later, I think he was kidding. He was trying to make light conversation and get me to laugh a little bit and interact with him. But I didn't know, I didn't know him, he didn't know me, and I didn't know how to respond. I don't think I responded at all. I think I smiled at him and got off as soon as the doors opened. <laughs> I know that I thought in my mind, yeah, and every time I come to your office, you send me a bill in return. 
Yeah, the work of God takes money, doesn't it? The work of God takes money. Dr. J. H. Jowett, who was a, a preacher in Britain, uh, Warren Wiersbe, who's one of my favorite preachers, says he was the greatest preacher of Britain. Dr. J. H. Jowett said, ministry that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. Ministry that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. If you're going to do the work of God, whether it's locally in this community or it's around the world, it's going to require resources. And Solomon comes and he says, cast your bread on the water. Don't hold back just because people don't understand what you're doing or think you're crazy in doing it. Don't limit it to a certain amount. You give and then you give some more. Not the seven or just eight, but just keep on giving. If you're patient, it'll come back to you. Are y'all with me? If you're patient, it'll come back to you. Because what he wants us to understand and be reminded of is that we should give generously, and then we should give some more. We should give generously, and then we should give some more. We don't just give to one level. We talk about the tithe, giving the tithe. Hey, friends, the tithe is the floor, not the ceiling. Did you get that? That's the entry level. That's the floor level. That's not the ceiling level. We're looking to give and then to give some more. How can we cast the bread on the water? How can we keep casting the bread, being liberal and as generous as we can possibly be? There's a second statement I want you to write down. The first, give generously and then give some more. But secondly, don't succumb to the paralysis of analysis. Don't succumb to the paralysis of analysis. Look again at verse 3. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. Do you get what he's saying? Now, everybody knows this. If you see a dark cloud off in the distance and it's moving in your direction, I mean, it's really dark. You might even see some flashes of light coming out of it. Maybe off in a distance, you can hear the thunder coming. You you know what about that cloud? It's about to dump a whole bunch of water on top of you. Or you can look at that tree. It's over there by your house. My parents lived on a two and a half acres uh, piece of property, and their house was in the middle of what looked like a forest. And they had these huge, enormous trees. My dad and mother always worried about those trees. They had some of them taken down because they were afraid they'd fall onto the house. But every time it rained and the wind blew hard or there was some tornado threat, there was always the concern about where that tree was going to fall. You hear what he's saying? If you sit and you just watch the clouds and wonder where is it going to go, what's it going to do, when's it going to get here, how much is it going to rain, Or you look at those trees and you think, "Mm, is it going to fall to the right? Is it going to fall to the left? Is it going to fall north? Is it going to fall uh, to the south? Which way is it going to fall? Every good tree falls to the south. But it's going to fall one direction or the other. And you spend your whole time analyzing so that you don't do what? You never go out into your field and you never sow the seed. That's what he says, verse 4. He observes the wind. He who observes the wind will not sow. And he who regards the clouds will not reap. I remember one time as a kid, a cloud came and it was raining on the other side of the road and the sun was shining on my side of the road. Any of you ever seen that before? Yeah, a lot of you. Raining on that side of the road. If you sit there and say, wait, I'm going to wait till the clouds are right and the wind is right and I know that tree is not going to fall. What you have is the paralysis of analysis. And you never do anything. It happens this way. People come to me as a pastor and they say, pastor, as soon as I pay off all my bills and I get out of debt, then I'm going to start giving to God and to the work of God. And I try as kindly and gently as I can. That's not the way you do this. You want God to help you get out of debt, don't you? You, you give your way out of debt. Say, I'm not sure about that, Pastor. Well, listen to what he says. Malachi chapter 3. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in, in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven. What does he say? Bring, bring your tithes to the storehouse 
and see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessings that there will not be room enough to receive it. Furthermore, he says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. You hear what he says? I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to hold back that which is going to cause problems to you because you invited me in by your generosity and by your giving. You know, sometimes when it comes to this matter of generosity, I just want to say to people, just do something. For heaven's sakes, just do something. You keep looking at your checkbook. You keep calling in the bank to find out what your balance is. You keep looking at your credit card. Just do something. They have the paralysis of analysis. That's what Solomon's talking about. I want you to cast your bread on the water. Don't sit and try to figure the clouds out. Is it going to rain today, not going to rain today? Is that tree going to fall to the left or to the right? If you spend all of your time looking and trying to figure out when's the right time to cast your bread, you've got the paralysis of analysis, and you will never do anything in the matter of generosity or liberality with God. I think I can illustrate this of something, with, with something that I heard about an old farmer, old Georgia farmer. And I think since I'm a Georgian, and since you all know that I'm a farmer, <laughs> I think you'll appreciate me telling the story. This old farmer was sitting on the steps of his house, this house that was about to fall apart. And a stranger stopped by for a drink from the farmer's well, and he asked, how's your cotton coming along? And the farmer replied, ain't got none. The stranger asked, did you plant any? He said, nope, afraid of boll weevils. The stranger asked, well, then how's your corn? He answered, didn't plant no corn either. Afraid there weren't going to be enough rain. The stranger continued, how are your potatoes? Didn't plant none. Scared of potato bugs. And finally, the frustrated stranger asked, well, what did you plant? And the farmer said, nothing. I just played it safe. The paralysis of analysis. I just played it safe. Now, I'm going to deviate a little bit from the sermon on generosity here for a moment because we live in a world that just wants to play it safe. I heard one preacher who was rather really, really, really frustrated with people who just always want to play life safe. This is what he said. What we've created today is the most risk-averse society in history. We are the most seat-belted, bike-helmeted, airbagged, knee-pad-wearing, gluten-free, hand-sanitized, peanut-avoiding, sunscreen-slathering, hyper-insured, massively medicated, password-protected, valet park, security system, inoculated generation in history, and all it's done is make everyone more afraid of everything. I think he was a little frustrated. But that's how we think God wants us to live our lives, even through a pandemic. We think that's how God wants us to live our lives. Play it safe. Don't take any risk. Make sure that it's all about you. Let me ask you a question. Did God ask Abraham to play it safe in leaving Ur of the Chaldees? Did God ask Moses to play it safe in returning to Egypt? Did God ask David to play it safe as he faced Goliath? Did God ask the three Hebrew children in Daniel to play it safe in the fiery furnace? Did God ask Elijah to play it safe as he approached King Ahab? Did God ask Ruth to play it safe in moving uh, to Bethlehem, Judah? Did God ask Rahab to play it safe as the walls fell down all around her? Did God ask Jesus to play it safe in coming to this earth? to die I suggest to you the play it safe mentality is killing us it's taken all of the adventure out of life we're always measuring and we're always analyzing and we have not just in the realm of our resources our time our talents and our treasures but we have in every other aspect of our lives the paralysis of analysis and we keep looking at the clouds well, it may rain today i might not better go out today a lot of people got up this morning and said it's raining i'm not going to church i pity people like that 
If a little rain can keep you away from church, your salvation isn't much, is it? Play it safe. Play it safe. Did you know that there's a risk in almost every aspect of life? There is a risk that comes from being a generous, liberal giver. Amen? Even our generosity requires risk. It means that you have to stop reading the clouds, watching the wind, and calculating which way the trees may fall before you decide to obey God and give generously. Number one, give generously and then give some more. Number two, don't succumb to the paralysis of analysis. But finally, have faith in the God of the outcome. Verses five and six. Have faith in the God of the outcome. Now, I don't know if you noticed it when we read through it, but I want to point it out to you. Will you look in the middle of verse two? He says, for you do not know. Will you look at verse five? As you do not know, in the middle of verse 5, so you do not know. Or will you look in the middle of verse 6, for you do not know. You get the idea that Solomon wants us to know that there's some things we don't know? You get that idea? Solomon says, you don't understand the wind, how it's coming or where it's going. You don't even fully understand how a baby grows and develops in a mother's womb. And what you have to do when it comes to the matter of generosity is you have to step out in faith and you have to believe in the God of the outcome. What did he say? Cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days. There's got to be patience, but you will find it. You say, but I got to see it. I gotta, I, you got to tell me what you're going to do with it. You know, there's people through the years that have been to me and they said, you know, I'm going to designate my giving. Now, there's some times when designated giving is good, but most of the time it isn't. Because what it means is I want to give, but I'm going to control what's done with what I give. Look, look, if you can't trust the leadership of your church to know that they're seeking God and they're going to obey the Lord to use the resources that are giving, given in the most appropriate and proper way, then you need to keep your money and control it yourself. Amen. You need to keep your money and control it yourself. Because the reality is that once you become generous and liberal in your giving, you let go of it. You throw it out onto the water. You don't know where it's going to go or how it's going to return to you. All you know is that I've got to believe that I've done what God told me to do, and I'm trusting in the God of the outcome that he'll bring it back to me. In his own time and in his own way, God will return it to me. You don't know what God's doing behind the scenes. You don't know. Maybe you gave something and it went somewhere you didn't think it should go, but God ended up moving all of that around to bring back greater rewards than have, would have ever been had if you'd have controlled where it went. I like the man who said one time, well, I give my money to the church so that my daughter can go to camp and it doesn't cost me anything. Then you're not giving. You're buying a service. You're not, you're not giving, you're buying a service. You're saying, I'm paying the church to pay for my daughter's camp. I'm not giving, I'm buying a service with my gift. That's, that's the opposite of what Solomon says. It's not about what I get, it's about what I give. It's not about whether everybody else understands it, casting bread on the water or not, because I know that in time, God will bring it back to me. And I want to look for more ways to be as generous as I can be. I'm not going to be, you know, with the paralysis of, na of analysis, unable to do anything. I'm going to do something. Just do something. Some of you have been a part of our church online. You've been a part of our online audience. You've never given once, let alone consistently, consistently to the work of God. You say, Pastor, we must need money. <laughs> no. That's why it's so fun to come preach this message. I don't have to come trying to wring it out of you. We don't owe anything anywhere. And God has provided, even through a pandemic, for every need we have, and every bill is paid and beyond. And even our new roof is getting the test out today. <laughs> you 
to have faith in the God of the outcome. Four times Solomon says, you don't know, you don't know, you don't know, you don't know. I don't know. I don't know. When I give, I don't always know what's going to become of my gift, but I know that God knows the heart with which I gave it, and God will return it as he sees fit. I read the story about a South African pastor. He was standing in line at a convenience store in New Orleans, and he noticed a family that didn't have enough money to pay for their few items. And so this South African pastor touched the father's shoulder and asked him not to turn around. That have scared me. Asked him not to turn around, but to take the money he was handing him to pay his bill. It was in his hand. Take the money out of my hand. Don't turn around. I don't want you to see me. Just take the money. Nine years later, that same pastor was in New Orleans again as a guest speaker. After the service, a man walked up to him and shared how he'd come to know Christ. He said, Pastor, years ago, his wife and their child were completely destitute, intending to take their lives together. They were going to drive off a cliff, but they decided they wanted to give their child one last meal before they all died. Standing in the store line, he realized the, item for the, the, the items for the meal cost more than he had. The man behind him said, please take the money from my hand, but told me not to turn to look at him. Then he said, Jesus loves you. The man said he drove back to the cliff, cliff and wept for hours before driving away. He said they couldn't go through with suicide. The next Sunday, they attended a church displaying a sign that said, Jesus loves you. And through a small act of generosity in that store and the words, Jesus loves you, that God used from that pastor, three lives were saved because they were drawn to that church and they heard the gospel and they trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior. He said nearly a decade later, this man told this South African pastor that when he heard him speak that day, he immediately recognized his distinctive voice and accent. That man speaking is the man that nine years earlier had slipped that money to me. And it changed my life. You got to trust and have faith in the God of the outcome. When God tells you to give something, you might not always understand. You might always, might not, might not always make sense to you, but you cast your bread on the water. You cast your bread on the water. And you're generous and you're liberal in your giving. When we give, we just have to trust God that he will use our gifts to change lives. So let me give you three practical points. Just write them down. I'm through. Number one, prioritize your resources so that God and his work come first. Prioritize your resources so that God and his work come first. Don't put God down at the end of your pay period. You put God at the beginning of your pay period. You say, God, the first thing that comes out is what I'm giving away, my, my bread that I'm casting on the water. Number two, look for ways to increase your personal investment in eternity. Why is it that we're not more like Mr. Letourneau? That when God starts blessing us and pouring it out to us, we think God intends for us to hoard it. Let's start keeping more of it. When God wants you to be the channel through which he gives even more, look for ways to increase your personal investment in eternity. And number three, give generously and leave the rest to the providence of God. Give generously and leave the rest to the providence of God.